In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us put ourselves in the presence uh, of the Lord. Lord, graciously give us your Holy Spirit. Guide us from within. Give us your light, your discernment. Show us the way. Incline our heart and will toward yours. And we ask you this through the powerful intercession of Our Lady, who is always present among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, good evening, uh, everybody, and good evening for or morning, whoever is watching us uh, on uh, video. Uh, we are continuing uh, chapter 11, a very, very interesting um, chapter. The last two videos were a bit shortened because of the technical uh, problem I had to have the text. This time we have um, everything uh, ready, God willing. So um, if you don't mind, I will share uh, the screen uh, with you so you can follow uh what i am doing so you normally now should be seeing um the um yeah uh chapter 11 uh, we are right now in paragraph four not in the beginning of it but just where we left it which is with this uh, sentence here for as long as uh, etc so just to refresh our mind of uh, about what is um, how we can understand this chapter again I renew uh, an advice that I gave certainly uh, in the beginning it is true that we have John of the Cross in front of us uh, of us we, we have one author we don't have two or three authors, uh, etc. Uh, and usually, in order to understand an author, it is important to have a knowledge of, of course, the historical context, etc. But also, for us now distant, like 500 years distant from him, it is important to um, uh, know the rest of the writings of the author, uh, and here we are dealing with an immense amount of uh, information in all the other uh, books. And it takes time, it takes years in order to have uh, the, the, the full vision of uh, how he sees things. Uh, and it's not easy. Uh, if you, you feel that you are failing, don't worry. I would say that this is uh, normal because it is extremely rich, extremely detailed, and he covers almost all the span of the spiritual growth. Now, that's obvious what I'm saying, which is if you want to study an author, you need to, to read all the author and to be very familiar for years. So then when you read something written somewhere, you can understand it maybe through other passages uh, from the text. That's normal. We should do that. Um, and, and with St. John of the Cross, we have a great uh, change, I would say, in tone and in contents uh, from one book to the other. If you compare Ascent and Dark Knight on one hand with a spiritual canticle or Living Flame, it's like you have two different authors. Uh, you have the impression that what he's saying on uh, some in the, the the first couple of books is something, and then uh, in the others it's not only different, but it's sometimes even opposite. Uh, it's an impression, but you need to know to be very familiar in order to understand why. Now that the soul reached a certain level of uh, purification and union, why he talks uh, about 
what is happening to the soul in a, in a different way, etc., etc. Now, what I'm getting to is uh, the other point on how to read uh, John of the Cross. Um, it is rather a Carmelite uh, understanding of it. Um, I am personally uh, following uh, Blessed Father Marie Eugène, uh, the French Carmelite um, who died in 68, 1968, and one of his uh, disciples and later uh, a companion, Father Louis Guillet, uh, who died in 92. Um, they used, and I think it is wise to do it this way, they used a triangular uh, method. Uh, I, you might have one or two short videos on it in the School of Mary's um, um, channel on YouTube where you're watching uh, the video. Um, the triangular method, I have mentioned it before, I re-mentioned it again because this is what I am doing, right? I will be continuing to do uh, in this chapter, which is uh, the Carmelite, the Carmelite saints and doctors, at least the three of them, that uh, the greatest uh, of them, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, and St. Therese of the Child Jesus, are sharing the same spirit. So it doesn't make sense to say, um, to separate them, to create a distance between them, or worse, even an opposition between them. They have the same spirit. The contents is exactly uh, the same, but the way to express it, the way to uh, understand it sometimes, or the way to develop certain aspects is, go, is different from one to the other. So opposing them is, could be, is very dangerous uh, and uh, damaging uh, for a, a proper reading. Uh, I perfectly understand that we are reading one author, which is John of the Cross, and then we're not reading the others. So what's the point of mixing uh, things? We are not mixing, but we understand that the, there is um, a, a common spirit between them and we can't oppose them. That's a technique of work, you might disagree uh, with it, fair enough. Um, I, I personally uh, see it as something extremely uh, good. Uh, Father Marie Eugène himself uh, started first with Teresa of Avila, who is more practical, more alive, more existential, more, more toward the experience and describing the experience we have which I would say it's rather the language we use um, these days. Uh, John of the Cross is rather as having a different approach. Um, he has a, a very strong philosophical and theological uh, background. He's very much, uh, very much um, um, immersed uh, all the time in the uh, sacred scriptures. And of course, uh, his knowledge of certain other books, etc., that of course Riz of Avila maybe hasn't read, um, is there in the background. So his approach is, uh, in a way, more powerful and more sharp in in for discernment, certain discernment uh, issues. Now, I feel in this chapter, and I repeat what I said before, so apology if you feel that it's a bit boring uh, hearing me repeating myself again and again. I feel that in this chapter, uh, Teresa of Avila is very much present. I wouldn't dare say that she's in his mind right now while he's writing these uh, lines, but it's very difficult to think otherwise. Um, you will see when we will read the, the, the next uh, paragraphs that uh, he, he's almost talking about her case, but he never, never uh, mentioned uh, her. And we shouldn't reduce everything uh, only on Teresa of Avila. It's just a possibility. This is why I said it's a case study, but you can take also St. Therese of the Child Jesus constantly, constantly as a case study, as an application or implementation of the teaching of both John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. So the triangle is this one, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross and St. Therese, St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So 
it is important, I would say, to find uh, harmony between the three. And if, you, if it's not really working perfectly, well, it's fair to doubt a little bit uh, your own interpretation, okay? Uh, it is very delicate. Uh, we are dealing with uh, the things that touch the soul, the will, the daily life, uh, the spirit, the Holy Spirit, etc. So it's not, um, uh, how can I say, it's, um, there are delicate things. I mean, we can't, we can't just go black and white on, on, on certain things uh, without knowing, without discernment, etc. And of course, if I'm explaining or talking, I I don't do it in my name, I do it in the name of a tradition that I personally uh, received. Otherwise, it'd be completely foolish from my side to speak. Uh, who am I to interpret uh, John of the Cross out of my own uh, mind or, 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 or knowledge? That's, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, it is important, but it wouldn't be enough, okay? So, uh, having said that, I renew uh, my... Uh, uh, key to read and understand in an easier way uh, the boldness of John of the Cross throughout and more precisely in this chapter throughout his writing and more in this in this chapter uh, to remember the case of Teresa of Avila and her story I did mention her I did told, tell about her in the previous uh, lessons okay so uh, this is I think lesson 17 if I'm uh, if I'm not wrong so, uh, yeah, listen, lessons 16a and, um, I mean, 16 and 16a, um, two parts, um, uh, I have mentioned that. So, uh, remember Teresa of Avila, and this will make, I would say, <laughs> you make things a bit easier, uh, and uh, his uh, fierce insistence on uh, being, uh, seeking perfection, even in the slightest, imperfection uh, it would it would be made uh, more alive and easier to, to understand not less radical but easier to understand okay and we are in a case where Teresa of Avila is attached to a person uh, you, you wouldn't expect that you say oh, religious people are free they are, they have other problems than us I, I wouldn't go easily this way um, it is true that uh, we live different lives, but the human being is the same, uh, the heart is the same, the will is the same. Um, so we are attracted by the same three main uh, temptations, uh, power, um, pleasure and possession. Uh, the human being will not change uh, since Christ and since before Christ, thousands of years probably or, or, or more. And now the human being is is the same. So uh, it's not because they are religious or monks, and uh, we are not that uh, things are, are are different or that different. You see, uh, the attractions, the weaknesses are more or less uh, the same. So thank God, it helps us also understand ourselves, etc. So let us, uh, without further ado, sorry for this long introduction. Uh, uh, continue our reading of this chapter. So repeating the last sentence uh, <clears throat> I have mentioned, which is this, as for as long as it has this, there is no possibility that it will make progress in perfection. Okay, even though the imperfection be extremely slight. So he's talking about something uh, very apparently very uh, slight. Remember, the case of Teresa of Avila is just an inclination and attraction toward a person, but there is no sin, there is way, no, no uh, mortal sin at all. It is probably between venial sin, yeah, definitely a venial sin, and um, an imperfection. Um, remember, she used to um, receive people and talk about God, so we are not really dealing of, about something really bad. So you see how... Uh, it is subtle and, and, and interior. It's not something that you could see. And again, as I said it before, it slips through the fingers of the moral theology, uh, the commandments. Uh, if you check your conscience before going to confession, you check, have I loved God? Have I loved my, my neighbor? And uh, uh, in the case of a, of, a, of a consecrated person, have I obeyed? Have I been faithful to the rule of, or the constitutions or whatever uh, the, the purpose of, of the life of this person is? 
you might very well not mention it and um, it, it, but it's still there and it is a hindrance for uh, growth uh, and remember uh, the uh, his statement no he he talks about uh, ensuring this this growth or um, stopping or going backward uh, in in the progress uh, there is no possibility it will make progress in perfection uh, i insist uh, a lot on uh, remembering this uh, what we need is progress i have said it before and if there is anything that stops us uh, that it should attract our attention so this teaching is of of utmost uh, importance but again it should be interpreted in the correct way so we put the pressure we we are decided for the lord we don't we are vigilant but as i said with some help also from time to time from a person because otherwise certain temperaments could go uh, could um, could sort of uh, reach a, maybe a nervous breakdown if you're, we don't pay attention uh, enough to how it should be done uh, and to which extent, okay? Because we might lose sight of the chord of the dynamics. And we will see this in chapter 13, which soon we will start after this one because chapter 12 is just one or two lines. I will comment them and then we will enter in chapter 13, which is the chapter par excellence of uh, book one. Um, the core of what is at stake is the love of Jesus. What moves us? Why do we do this? Why we will be very vigilant? Because our gaze and his gaze never leave each other, or at least this is the starting point. This is what sustains us, what supports our um, this pressure that we, we, we put. Why do we do it? We do it for the love of Jesus. We do it because we want to imitate Jesus, because Jesus is the center. So it's not a set of rules that we are applying. It's not checking negatively, I would say, mortal sin, venial sin, imperfection. I would rather say, in order to implement what John of the Cross is saying in, in, a, in a correct way, according to his spirit and his mind, it's to focus on Jesus. Determination, the determination comes because of the object that we are pursuing, and the being or we are in relationship, the person we are in relationship with, Jesus and the love of Jesus, you see? So it's not done as a set of rules that's the danger asceticism could sometimes become a set of rules very tough very rough and this could be the wrong reading of chapter 13 uh, which is uh, go for the more difficult don't do this do that etc so you focus on what to do and you forget the spirit in which things are supposed to be done so please remember always that uh, we are heading towards chapter 13 and I'm preparing the way he is preparing the way for it. And, and this is uh, the key. Why and how am I doing it? It's because of the Jesus and the love of Jesus. You see, that's the key. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, let us continue. For it comes to the same thing whether a bird be held by a slender cord or by a stout one. If you have a very thick cord or just a little thread or a hair, very, very thin, uh, the bird will not be able to fly. So this is what John of the Cross is trying to show us. It's, it's not because it is an imperfection, which is the thread, the little, the little hair that is hold, still holding us, it's not because it's an imperfection that it's fine. It will still uh, ho um, hold us uh, because uh, remember we are talking about the uh, voluntary desires. Voluntary desires. And remember the examples he gave above. How, what could it be? An attachment. Hmm. Attachment. Slight attachment to a person to a garment, to a book, to a cell. Uh, so people who think that maybe religious are, are vive, uh, live a, a, another life completely and that they don't have the problems we have, no. <laughs> Religi religious people have 
are like us. Uh, they, they can be attached to a person, to a garment, uh, clothes, to a book, to a place, uh, the a cell. I prefer this cell than the other one. Uh, a particular kind of food. Yes, of course, because we all eat. Uh, uh, fancies of tasting, uh, wearing things or adding things. It could be something very silly, even very poor, but so it's just an attachment, you see. Um, I know you might find this exaggerated. It's, you know, he speaks out of experience, so we, we could trust him. I would insist a lot also on the emotional side, which is the attachment to a person. And the attachment to a garment, a book is rather for the material detachment, but attachment to a person is, is, is involves more uh, in, a, in, a, in a greater way the uh, emotional side. Okay, now let us continue. Where were we? It is true that the slender one is the easier to break. We're back with the bird who cannot fly because of a little thread or a little hair. Still easy though it be, the bird will not fly away if it's not broken. And thus the soul that has attachment to anything, again I insist, it is a positive, willing, active, attachment towards something. It's not an inclination. Ah, I like, I don't know, this type of um, uh, cookies or chocolates, or I like this, that. I like it, yes, you like it, that's fine. But are you pursuing it? Are you focusing on it? Uh, are you acting toward it? That's different. You can be very much attached to a person. But if you are not doing anything to reach this person, uh, and if you are just abiding to what you are supposed to do, to the will of God, put it this way, to the will of God, well, then this attachment is rather a natural or passive attachment, is not jeopardizing uh, your, our growth. You see what I'm trying to say? So, an attachment to anything, however much virtue it possesses, will not attain, attain the liberty of divine union. Mm? Liberty. The accent here should be put on the word liberty. Mm? He wants us to be free. John of the Cross wants us to be free. Mm? Blessed the pure of heart. Purity, detachment, freedom are the same in this case. You see? Purity detachment and freedom to do the will of God, to be united with God, this is what, what is important, you see? So how can we do this? Of course, he doesn't write it. We can offer to God this attachment and say, okay, Lord, I'm attached to this, I, to this person, to this object, to this purpose, to this goal. I offer it to you. I entrust it to you. I put you above everything else. So what you are doing here, you are conscious of your weakness, you are conscious of your attachment, possible. Um, it, it is strong, naturally, uh, passively, um, but you, you, you fear it could become active. So you say, okay, you act now, you show to the Lord uh, your will. You can make a prayer for that. Say, oh Lord, please help me because this is what I want and help my will to be determined for your will. You see, we, we can always transform our weakness or our attachment into a prayer in order to uh, have this liberty, this freedom uh, to, to uh, vacate, to be, to, to be free, um, um, to, to do God's will. Uh, we talked about Lectio Divina, uh, we're not that far from what John, St. John of the Cross says, because he talks about doing the will of God. And what is Lectio Divina? It's to listen to, the, to Jesus' will and, and, and do it, to please him, you know, as would St. Therese say. So this um, preparation or the, to reach that point of Lectio Divina, we need to put God above everything else. This is why it costs us a lot uh, to do it. Why? Because 
we are still immersed in ourselves while Lexi Divina listening, or if you prefer, focusing on Jesus. Instead of saying Lexi Divina, say this, focusing on Jesus on a day, taking time to focus on him and say, okay, your will, not my will. To tell me about your will. That's, that's the key, no? That's what is uh, at stake. So uh, when I do that, I emerge, I, I, I rise above myself, my attachments, the creatures, etc. This is why this act cost me, because it's an act of freedom or of purity or of detachment from myself, from my desires, from anything that is burdening me. You see what I'm trying to say? It's important also for prayer. How can I pray if I am burdened by uh, my worries, if I am burdened by um, my desires, etc.? It's important to lay them, uh, put them in God's hands in order to uh, reach, at least momentarily, which is an act to reach that freedom, that liberty, to be with him, you see. And he appreci God appreciates that, no? If God is above the water, and I'm, my head and all my body are inside of the water, say the sea, how can I talk to him? I can't. So I need to rise above the water. And the water he is, here is the symbol of these uh, attachments or, or um, uh, burdens, uh, etc., so every time I need to renew that act and I renew it because I, I sink again, I sink back again because the daily life is an immersion in uh, busyness. No, I'm busy, uh, even simple things, cooking, ironing, cleaning. It's, I could uh, go a little bit astray. I could, I don't have to, but I could, so I may, I may worry for something or somebody or in any, in any place. So, it's important to renew that liberty. You see, this, this depends on us. This depends on us. So we are not waiting for something to happen. We make it happen. You see, I choose that freedom. I say, okay, Lord, I love this person, but you are above this person. You are more important than this person. I want to love you more and I want to love this person because of you and, and with the way you love this person. So free me, Lord, from this uh, attachment, that emotional attachment, or purify it, better said. It's not that I don't want to love this person. I want to love this person the way you love this person. That's a completely different thing, you see. So this, I transform. Whenever I feel something, I transform it into a prayer, you see. Very humbly, I lay my soul in the hands of uh, the Lord. Now. <clears throat> for the desire, I'm, I'm continuing the, to read here, I'm here, for the desire, for the desire and the attachment of the soul have that power which the suck fish, it's a type of fish that sort of sticks its mouth and then starts to, to suck. The suck fish, sucking fish, sorry, is said to have when it clings to a ship. You have this type of... Uh, fishes that cling to a ship and then they slow the ship completely and the, sh the ship cannot um, uh, sail uh, properly. For though, for though but uh, a very small fish, even though it is a very small fish, if it succeeds in clinging to the ship, it makes it incapable of reaching the port or of sailing uh, on at all. So you see, he's trying to find images just to convince us that we cannot really reach or be with the Lord in prayer, in contact during the day or specifically when we are praying, if we do not free ourselves, you see, from this burden. Now here, underlined in Greek, in, in green here, you see the emotion uh, of a spiritual uh, master uh, feeling for the people. Uh, he knows and he sees, uh, etc., because he certainly had many opportunities to help people or to live with people and see the uh, the state of the soul of of this person. So he said, "It is sad to see certain souls in this plight, like rich vessels. They are laden with 
Am I pronouncing it properly? I forgot now. Sorry. Yeah, Leiden. With wealth and good and good works and spiritual exercises. And with the virtues and the favors of God, uh, uh, the favors that God grant them. And yet, so we are not talking about people who are like neglecting their spiritual life. We are talking here about people who are allegedly committed to God and fervent and following him. You see, that's very important here. We are not just going to evangelize people and say, convert and follow Jesus. That's not the case. That's a bit after, you see. We are talking here about way after, uh, which corresponds to the case of St. Teresa, Saint Teresa of, of, uh, of Avila, which is the case of her conversion. It's 20 years in that tormented sea, she says. 20 years in this tormented sea see going up and down and not being able to really enter properly in a spiritual life so you might very well be having a lot of spiritual wealth and good works good works spiritual exercises virtues and favors received graces received by god and despite all that yet because they have not the resolution to break with some. It's ridiculous. Now, when you think about it, it's like you say, but that's nonsense. Why would a person do that? Or why God will allow it to happen? Well, it does happen. He respects our freedom. Hmm? With some whim or attachment or affection. Hmm? Think of Teresa of Avila. It's an affection. No, She had an affection to you know, it's, it's, it's nice to meet some people. Uh, if you are um, uh, uh, an extrovert person, if you like uh, socializing, it's nice to meet some people and speak about God and uh, spend hours with them. Oh, how beautiful, no? But in the end, there is a certain attachment to that. So God is not the first in, in your heart. There is something else in your heart. But despite that, when, the, when she goes back to her daily life, she's very fervent, she's very spiritual, very committed. And look, look what, how he describes her in a way, I think. I, he never says that it's her, of course. This is me only. Eh? But please don't go and say that Jean says that chapter 11, this is Teresa of Avila. <laughs> no. uh, or sorry, John of the Cross says that. No, no, no. It's just me who feels that she's present. Huh? Uh, wealth and good works. Teresa of Avila is not a bad person during these 20 years. Be careful. Don't judge her this way. Spiritual exercises. 20 years of religious life. Virtues. Favors. Graces. You see? It's shocking. And despite all that, there's a little thing there. You see? Um, it could be little... But it still, it has, I would say, this is me talking, of course, not him. It could, be the say, have, it could have the same weight that Abraham, that uh, Isaac, Abraham's son, uh, the same weight, weight he had in, in his father's heart. And who can blame a father or a mother to um, love their child? It's impossible. You can't. You can't do that. But mysteriously, the Lord will ask Abraham to put the Lord first before his son. The goal, of course, when he asks him to offer his son into, in a sacrifice, as a sacrifice, of course, God didn't want to harm his son at all. It's not about the son. It's about Abraham. It's about the attachment of Abraham. Uh, this is, and it's the same language that Jesus uses in the gospel. So we are, we are not really talking about something uh, that is alien to, to the gospel. We are at the core of the gospel. Jesus says, if you love uh, your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, uh, your friend, whoever, uh, your country, your country, you know, uh, more than me, then it doesn't work. You won't be able to follow me. You see, that's, it's in the more. Or yourself. More than me. So, how 
um, can I become aware? That's another question. It's not, it's between the lines. Can I become aware of this attachment? Am I aware of it? This is why consideration and examining our conscience under the light of God, under the light of Jesus' love. It is Jesus' love. The, 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 the closer we draw to Jesus and Jesus' love, the better the Holy Spirit and Jesus' love work in us. So he sheds light in our heart. And he is the one who asks silently, Abraham, give me your son. Or Teresa of Avila, give me these persons you, are, you want to meet every day or every now and then. You see what I'm trying to say? Because you can ask yourself, how can I know? Is it a set of rules? How can I examine my conscience? It is by looking at Jesus. It's not in clearly stated now, right now, in this passage in the text. But this is how he is working. This is how John of the Cross is working. It's not because he's not mentioning Jesus at every line of his writing that Jesus is not there. Jesus is constantly there in his writings. And, and the, 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 the risk is to read what he says in a different way, in a different spirit from the, his spirit, you see? So the attachment is there. I, I gave you, I think, the example of Therese, no? climbing the stairs in her monastery. She had two, two of her sisters already in the monastery, two of her blood sisters in the monastery. So this is, makes it very complicated, very complicated. If you have your sister inside of a monastery, it is really, uh, difficult because you mix things become mixed the blood ties and uh, the love of the one another uh, could get mixed you see and then you could sort of have an, a, not only an inclination which is natural in this case to your sister but you could then want to spend time etc and she felt that in her heart because Jesus asked for it not because it was a set of rules that she wanted to apply. No, because she was focused on Jesus. It's impossible to implement that type of advice if Jesus is not at the center and the core of our life. It's impossible. Uh, I remember talking many years ago to a, a prioress, a Carmelite, cloistered Carmelite turns prioress, no? And we were talking about uh, a girl, no? Who wanted to, to enter. And uh, we both agreed. And I, I said, okay, if, if she doesn't have the vocation, if, if it's just her imagination, we both know that she won't last one day. Because everything inside of the monastery talks to you about Jesus. So it becomes, if Jesus is not really your love, the love of your life, you won't be able to cope one day in the monastery because the monastery is all engineered around Jesus. So why would you do this? Why would you do that if Jesus is not there? You won't have the energy to do it. You, you will feel like you are in a prison. While if Jesus is at the center of your life, at the core of your existence right now, everything talks to you about him. You will be happy. You will be like a fish in the water. You see what I'm trying to say? You see? So... It, the same applies here. These sets of rules are hell for a person who doesn't have Jesus uh, as a core. Be careful. That's the key of understanding uh, uh, all the writings of John of the Cross, and more specifically, the ones that appear a bit too harsh, like uh, Ascent of Mount Carmel, Book 1. You see? So yes, the girl can enter. She wants to enter, may, let her enter. It, she, it's, uh, if, it's not the right moment. Or if worse, it's not, there is no call there from Jesus to enter. She won't last one day. She will escape. She'll open the door and, and, and what? She, will, she will want to open the door because you, 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 you can't open the door that, that easily. You see, you need to have two, two or three persons. So you, you, um, you will escape. You won't bear it. It's the same here. It's as if you are in a Carmelite monastery and if Jesus is not really the love of your life what does it how could you accept even the idea of what happened to abraham uh, accept it for yourself it's impossible you will find it cruel you will find it unbearable you will find it like pff, rubbish 
or worse, like some do today, you know, that's a, a myth, no? It's not a real story, it's just, uh, didn't never happened, no? Never happened. So, you, you see what is at stake. It's, it's a living connection and presence uh, with the Lord, and he comes, if I allow him, of course, in my heart and talks to me and said, okay, give me this, you see? Give me that attachment to this person, to this uh, uh, thing, to, I don't know, whatever it is, you see, give, give me that, uh, because I'm above that, you see, and it is, it is inevitable, because we have a heart, we have a heart, we have emotions, and this is normal, it is inevitable to have a certain attachment, even to people who are good, we're not talking about a bad attachment, it's a good attachment, can you blame Therese, Saint Therese of the child Jesus, to be attached to her father, Declared saint, she's saint, he's saint. She had an attachment. She had, a, she had, a, she had the attachment, and even that attachment, God asked her to offer him this attachment, which, which of course you can find cruel, but she said, well, then Jesus' love is greater than that. You see, that's the answer of Therese. It must be that Jesus' love is greater than what I thought, if he's asking for this. He's introducing me to a new levels of understanding of him, Jesus. What is at stake is a new step in Jesus. It's not just to be detached and that's it, so we still have the same Jesus. No, no, no. If you detach, if you offer it to Jesus, if you say, okay, Lord, it breaks my heart, it tears my heart, it puts it into pieces. But I offer you that, Lord, that attachment. The gain here is immense because you treated Jesus as the, role, uh, the real proper uh, groom. You see, the spiritual groom, the, the, the husband. You see, the spouse, uh, better said, the spouse. So you treat him royally by offering him the best of, of, of your attachment. He will treat you uh, royally. You see, uh, that's, that's important here to, to remember. So what is at stake? It's not only to be detached and free. No. <laughs> this will bring us, a, a, will, 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 um, will bring us, will make us uh, enter deeper in Jesus and discover new depth in Jesus himself. So it's not just a please for the sake of it, you have to be detached from everything in order to just be, stay there, sit there, be with Jesus. That's not the, the, the that's not what is at stake at all. What is at stake is entering deeper in Jesus. For Abraham, he entered deeper in God when he said to God, okay, you come before my son. It's, it's horrible, no? It's, it's cruel. It's difficult because you love your son. You love your daughter or your father, in the case of Therese of the child Jesus, or your mother, no? You love them. Who, who can ask you not to love? That's nonsense. It's even the, the commandment, no? You love and, and serve and venerate your, your parents, no? Uh, that's a commandment. But God comes above this. So it's not that we shouldn't love them, no. It's we should love them the way Jesus wants us to love them, which is a different thing. This is why Therese says, I don't understand why people say that we shouldn't love our parents or, or this and that, which was the interpretation or understanding for religious life in her time, no? Uh, you should sort of like cut and separate, all, uh, separate yourself, cut all the ties with your family, etc., and sort of in order to focus with Jesus. She says, I don't understand that. Because I feel that the more I love Jesus, the more I love my family. But <laughs> explain, explain. Uh, the more I love Jesus, the more I love my family the way Jesus loves the family. So, of course, the love will grow because it's the same love. It's my love for Jesus that is growing. Therefore, I love them, but in a purer way, in a detached way, but in a purer way. Uh, the, mo the more we grow, say, for instance, take for instance, a nun or, or even a lay person in his or daily life, no? The more we love Jesus, the more we love our family, our brothers and sisters, uh, our own family, like if we're married, uh, etc. The more we love them, but we love them 
having our heart totally in the in the hands of Jesus. So paradoxically, we love them more, but we are more detached. That's the great paradox. They can't catch our heart, paradoxically, no? But in the same time, all our heart belongs to them because our heart is carried by Jesus. So Jesus decides, Jesus moves. I don't know if I'm getting myself uh, clear here. Uh, it's a paradox. Uh, the more we love Jesus, the more we love and we are really present to our, um, the, our brothers and sisters, no? But we are more taken uh, by him. We belong more to him. You see, that's the paradox. It's as if we are like in an in a invisible uh, protection uh, or invisible recollection but in the same time we are more present than the average uh, person uh, to, to them. You see what I'm trying to say? Okay, let us continue then. <clears throat> so I hope I'm making, I'm, I'm making it closer to you, more palpable, how to do it also, what is happening in our heart and, and what, um, um, how can we come out of this because it's normal we have emotions we have affections we have attachments that's that's the weakness of the human being and of course it's the possibility to love god if you don't have a son if abraham doesn't have a son he cannot offer anything to god which affection will will he will he offer you see so uh, it's also an opportunity to love god uh, So, um, and yet, because they have not the resolution, 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 Lord, give me the resolution. Lord, so, um, give me a Holy Spirit so I could be determined to put you above anything, everything else. Lexu Divina is a renewal of that, by the way. In the morning, it's a renewal of the purity. To break with some whim or attachment or affection, which all come to the same thing. They never make progress or reach the port of perfection. So we are all called to perfection. We are all called to holiness, but we don't reach. Why? Explanation here. And this is just in the beginning of the journey. We are not yet uh, uh, crossing uh, new hurdles or, 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 or um, new, new stages, no? Though they would need to, though they would need to do no more than make one good flight and thus to snap that cord of desire right off or to rid themselves of that sucking fish of desire which clings to them, you see? Yeah, it is a sad, it is, as he says here, it is sad to see. It is a very sad thing uh, because um, it's just one thing what the person doesn't want to surrender. So what will happen in this case? Uh, I hear a, a question, no? what will happen in this case? Well, we have the story of Teresa of Avila. I think her story is, is um, It's heartbreaking in a way because 20 years, 20 years of not settling, settling, settling properly in God, 20 years of practicing virtues, some virtues, not all of them, not the way they should be, not putting full power, practicing the prayer of the heart. Contemplative prayer, adoration. It's like you go to, to, to church and, and practice adoration every day, two, two, two hours a day, for instance, or something along these lines. And despite all that, there is no growth. Why? Because that's not enough. This is what I was saying the other day to a group of youngsters. No, I was talking about Lex Divina. I said, you can practice all types of prayer, but if you don't challenge yourself, with the type of prayer that really en en enacts in you change, you can stay there for, for years. 
So what what will what is what will happen? And Lexi Divina is the one that challenges. The others, no. You can say the rosary, ten rosaries a day if you want, but you are not challenging yourself. You are not allowing God to challenge you. Lexi Divina, uh, listening to the word of God, if you prefer. No. So Teresa of Avila stays like that, ill-advised, for twenty years. It tells you something about the church. This is me talking here. It's not John of the Cross, not Teresa of Avila, but it tells us something about the church. Remember the context of uh, the historical context of Teresa of Avila. Hmm? It's the Protestant Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation. No, it's few years, few decades before Teresa of Avila, and before that, for three centuries, in different parts of the world, and the majority of the parts of the, the church, the church wanted to renew itself and to reform itself, but it failed. For three centuries, you see council after council, counter after council, good decisions, but never implemented. Good decisions, never implemented. You can study the history of the church. It it's really helps a lot because some people think we are in the end of the world right now. We are not in the end of the world. <laughs> we went through the end of the world many times before. Okay, so read the history of the church. It will strengthen also your uh, maybe sh shock you but after that you will find a different way of dealing with with the church you know understanding or loving the church in a different way so the church wanted to reform itself for three centuries before Teresa of avila and i see this is me talking of course it's not the text it's not john of the cross and i do apologize for that but i think it's important to sort of put things into perspective and understand what is underlined in green in the text which is it is sad to see it is greatly to be lament lamented what does it mean practically in the life of the church for three centuries before trees of avila the church wanted to reform itself and it failed, and it failed again, and it failed again, and then and then came uh, Luther and what he uh, offered, and uh, created a, a split in the church, and it's a disaster because it's a great division in the church, and it's not really the solution. You don't you don't solve the problems this way. Now, Teresa of Avila, I see her and John of the Cross as sent by God, prophets sent by God, but her life. Here, explained and illustrated by John of the Cross, her life is a paradigm in the sense that her 20 years before conversion are part of her teaching, integral part of her teaching. She is saying, I was ill-advised for 20 years. I didn't implement the right thing. I implemented some things, very important things. She learned prayer of the heart. Excellent, amazing. She was praying, she was a nun, she was committed. But despite all that, there is no growth at John of the a progress, as John of, Gross, John of the Cross puts it. There is no progress. Progress is fundamental. The notion of progress in the church, the spiritual progress, growth, is fundamental. And unfortunately, we still take it uh, like uh, in amateur, amateur way, like as it comes without professionalism, without proper knowledge, which Teresa of Avila says, many priests ill advised me and they gave me wrong advice or not the proper advice. Therefore, they hurt my spiritual life. They didn't allow me to grow. Ignorance, and as I call it, faithfully transmitted ignorance in the name of tradition or any or, or sorts of things, it's possible. It's very common, unfortunately. Uh, you know things, part of the things, but you don't know the whole thing. So you advise people to do certain things, but you don't know the rest. So what's the point? You are crucifying the person, you are forcing the person to, to do certain things, or inviting or teaching the person to do certain things, but it's half of the, the, the deal. So the person will not progress, will not grow. So you see, the, what is underlined in green, which is the sad reality, it is sad to see. Uh, it means that it is absolutely common, unfortunately, to see that, uh, to see people, to see the life of the church, three centuries in the case of Teresa before her, and after her, of course. <laughs> you can add the five centuries after her. It's the same, no? Uh, not learning from the lessons and 
um, as a consequence, um, we go in circles. We are, there is no progress. So you can talk forever and say everybody is called to holiness or any, everybody is called to the fullness of charity or perfection, which are uh, synonymous. But there is no growth. There is no growth. There is no, uh, why? Because there are uh, things that are stopping us from growing and there is nobody capable of seeing them. So we continue as he describes the person. It's amazing how he describes the person here. Huh? Wealth and good works and spiritual exercises. We're not talking about lazy people in the church. We are talking about the best amongst the best. People committed, spiritually committed, spiritual exercises, virtues, graces from God. You see? It's amazing, it's shocking, it's shocking. We are not dealing with sort of beginners, evangelization, all that stuff. We are talking about people who are fervent, committed, maybe leaders, etc. And the tragic thing is that you don't have proper progress or maybe you reach a point, a plateau, and then uh, you, 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 you go around in circles and you will see, we will continue. John of the Cross says there is no stabilization possible because if there is a problem here, we will go backward and he will describe it in the following uh, paragraphs. So it is tragic. It is tragic. It's heartbreaking to see this reality. Why? For a lack of understanding the human heart, lack of penetration, the, 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 the sight, the, the, the gaze entering deep and seeing where, where, what, the Lord is asking from us, which could be, as I said in the previous videos, the two videos, uh, lesson 16, uh, it's very politically incorrect. Who would have this language today? Um, it's, I, I don't know, maybe there are, uh, but it, it looks very, very, very tough, a very, uh, um, very radical uh, as a, an option. But this is why I try to make it real for you and see how could it happen. Uh, and it's the gospel. It's, it's the purity of the gospel itself. He who doesn't, he who loves his brother, sister, wife, husband, son, daughter, father, mother, more than himself, more than me, there is no growth, there is no progress, there is no entering in the kingdom of God, there is no crossing and entering there. Okay, so this also is an explanation of the reality uh, of, of the church, no, the weaknesses uh, of the church. Um, it's uh, it serves both ways, no, it explains what should be done, but it explains that if it's not done, what will happen, no. 20 years in the life of Teresa of Avila are the biggest lesson, I think, in her uh, reformation. Mm? Uh, she offers a reformation uh, better than others ref other reformations. Okay, so I think that we should stop here. Uh, um, I do apologize. I'm, you might feel that I'm going too slow. I'm not going slow at all. I'm just digging deeper or allowing his words to enter deeper in us, better said. Allowing his words, all the, not all of them, but some of the implications of his words to enter deeper in us and make us reflect and ponder uh, what, um, and it, it sheds a light. Huh? We can understand many things through, through that. So now we have new glasses that John of the Cross is giving us so we can understand ourselves in a better way. Or, or, or we have, the gospel glasses put properly on our eyes because this is the gospel nothing else than the gospel glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen so let me just